A space elevator might be tricky to do on Earth, but they're much easier on the Moon and may be perfect for helping with in situ resource extraction to fuel our expansion into the wider solar system. The concept of a space elevator is one that has fascinated folks since the late 20th century, and one we discussed on the show quite a few times, but also has some interesting variants worth discussing too. One example of that is a space tower, something we recently did an episode on, and those are enormously tall structures that rise up to low orbit rather than hanging down from geostationary orbit, relying on compressive strength rather than tensile strength. We also have an abridged version of elevators such as the Skyhook or Rotovator that a spaceship meets halfway up into the sky and uses to get the rest of the way into orbit. But another example is an elevator that is not on Earth, but is on planets or moons with very different gravities and day lengths, both of which really change the dynamics of an elevator and what you need to construct it, and indeed whether or not it would make sense to use one of those other approaches instead, like a lunar Skyhook or Space Tower or a mass drive or space catapult to simply launch ships down a very long track up to high speed and into space. Of course that's our focus for today, the particular case of a space elevator on the moon. This may turn out to be the first place we end up building a space elevator, and building one there rather than on Earth has several advantages as well as a few additional challenges. In order to discuss those, we'll first need to briefly discuss elevator basics such as material strength, how gravity impacts that, how they hang in space, how long they need to be, based on day length, and what their throughput would be. That last one is a pretty big deal with space elevators because they are long in the same way a continent spanning railroad or freeway is, and the usefulness of something like that is diminished if you can only have one train or cargo truck on it at the same time. Before we discuss those space elevator basics though, let's talk about the Moon. The Moon orbits Earth about once a month and critical to today's topic is the reminder that the month-long orbit of the Moon around Earth is both the Moon's day and year. It turns very slowly and indeed orbits very slowly. Earth orbits the Sun at around 67,000 miles or 108,000 kilometers per hour. At its equator, Earth spins around once a day at 1,000 miles or 1,600 kilometers per hour. The speed needed for low orbit around Earth is 17,000 miles or 28,000 kilometers per hour. All of those are faster than the Moon, which orbits Earth at 2300 miles or 3700 kilometers per hour and rotates on its axis at a mere 10 miles or 17 kilometers per hour, which is about the speed I usually average when I'm biking with my wife and we do not aim for speed. It's certainly not the supersonic rotational speed of Earth. Low orbital speed on the Moon, which is very low orbit indeed since there's no atmosphere to rise above, is roughly 3800 miles or 6000 kilometers per hour not even a quarter what it is on Earth, and that's even less than it sounds like in the context of the rocket equation or kinetic energy of a ship leaving. Which begs the question of if we really even need some big piece of infrastructure like an elevator, tower, or mass driver on the Moon, and is part of what we'll be discussing today. Now the key concept of a space elevator is that if you can find a material strong enough, you can run a tether, or a tower, if we're talking compressive rather than tensile strength, between the ground here on Earth and orbit. We generally assume the bottom is attached to the equator somewhere, although we'll discuss some other options like polar landing sites later. If you're on the ground, you're whirling around Earth's equator at 1000 miles or 1600 kilometers per hour. This obviously isn't orbital speed or all the ground would fly off into space from there, and indeed it's about 17 times faster, and that speed is the circumference of Earth at its surface divided by how quick the Earth turns, once every 24 hours. But the higher you are, the wider the circumference of a circle you're making in that same 24 hours, so the faster you would need to be going in order to remain in geosynchronous orbit, while at the same time, the speed you need to orbit the further you are from the planet goes down. This is the key concept of a space elevator, eventually those two speeds meet, and for the Earth that's at what we call geosynchronous orbit, once every 24 hours and the specific version of that right over the equator is geostationary, as you are orbiting right over the same spot all day. Problem is, this is very high up, 22,000 miles or 36,000 kilometers above Earth, considerably higher than the planet is wide. What's more, we actually want to go even higher if we can, since if our tether or tower reaches still higher, then the velocity it's whirling around at will keep rising, 
while the speed to orbit drops further, and above geostationary it will exceed what it needs, giving it a great boost to launch into deep space. And you need a counterweight on a tether above this height so it doesn't just fall down. Towers don't have this problem, they can be arbitrarily tall provided you have new materials with enough compressive strength or have mastered active sport technology. See that episode, Space Towers, for discussion. Either version needs to be way stronger though because they are trying to not only hoard up the weight of whichever vehicles we have climbing up them, but also their own weight too, and the stronger they are, the less of their own weight they need to hold. Every material has what we call a breaking limit, the amount of that material, based on its tensile strength and its density, that it could hold up as a rope of uniform diameter in normal Earth gravity before it breaks. Picture a rope, if long enough and dangled from high enough it will reach a length where its own mass snaps it free. It's breaking length or breaking limit. We have no material that at uniform diameter has a breaking limit of 22,000 miles or 36,000 kilometers, not even graphene or carbon nanotubes, but we don't need that because you can make something thicker or thinner on one side, rather than uniform in diameter, tapering off like a very long cylinder, or cone, and you can put that thick end up in space where the portion of the tether is practically weightless and you can hang a longer cord that way than the breaking length would ordinarily allow. Also that breaking length is in normal gravity, and that gravity gets weaker as you get further away, so we can't do a tapered elevator on Earth. Maybe. There's a lot of other challenges like weather, and we looked at that more in our space elevator episode way back. The moon is an easier case in almost every aspect, one would think. After all it has way weaker gravity and no air, and both of those factors absolutely do help. We have materials that you can build a lunar space elevator tether from today, and one that's tens of thousands of miles or kilometers long. So too, a space tower is way easier when you have vastly lower gravity and no air or weather. By this same logic, space elevators should work far better on places like the Moon, Mars, or Mercury, which have little to no atmosphere and far weaker gravity compared to Earth, and presumably even on Venus which while far closer to Earth's mass, still has a low enough gravity there that we could do an elevator there much more easily than on Earth. Indeed we need not anchor it to the ground there, which is basically lava, so we could do a moving tether sliding through the upper atmosphere, which lets us change some of the dynamics involved in terms of altitudes and speeds. Our problem here is that except for Mars, whose day length is just a little longer than Earth's, all those places I mentioned have way longer day lengths, or rotational rates. The term geostationary is specific to Earth, but to use it generically for a moment, geostationary on Mars is 8500 miles or 13,600 kilometers above the equator, and at a velocity of 3300 miles or 5200 kilometers per hour. Very doable and potentially useful, but our topic today is not Martian elevators, and sadly it is the best case of those four. It still works for our other two planets though. For Mercury the geostationary is 150,000 miles or 240,000 kilometers high and the orbital velocity up there is just about 700 miles or 1100 kilometers per hour. Venus is worse at first glance at 950,000 miles or 1,530,000 kilometers height to geostationary and an orbital speed of 1000 miles or 1600 kilometers per hour. We can't actually cheat on Venus though and leave the bottom of our tower in the upper atmosphere moving faster than the planet rotates, and this lets us make a shorter tether and one a little further out of Venus's gravity well on the bottom, though technically this is a non-rotating skyhook. This episode is not about skyhooks, mostly, or other planets, but they illustrate the issue the Moon has, and its own geostationary height is 54,000 miles or 87,000 kilometers up and the velocity up there to maintain geostationary orbit is only 540 miles or 860 kilometers per hour. Which is all fine except up there on a moon is a tricky concept at that scale. The moon is orbiting Earth and is only about four times further away than that geostationary height would calculate at, if it were just the moon. We can largely, though not entirely, ignore the gravity the moon has on Earth's space elevator since geostationary height over Earth is around a tenth the distance to the moon, not a quarter, and the Earth is 80 times more massive than the moon and 80 times stronger in its gravity as a result, or 8,000 times stronger than the gravity the moon exerts at that distance. 
What that means is that not only does Earth massively perturb anything orbiting the Moon that far away, but it's actually stronger than the pull of gravity the Moon exerts at the Moon's own geostationary distance. Or in summary, there isn't any geostationary orbit over the Moon. We've got several materials we can already mass produce that are strong enough even for that enormous length, but there's currently no known stable place for a classic elevator concept. Now, does that mean we can't build it? No. We've got a number of other options at this point, including a modified elevator option, skyhooks, space towers, and the mass driver approach, and our real question is what is best, but let's discuss the basic lunar elevator. One of our options is to abandon aiming for geosynchronous and instead aim for Lagrange points. Every two-body system has five Lagrange points, Earth has five with the Sun and five with the Moon. Jupiter has five with the Sun, and two of them, the L4 and L5 Trojan points, which are 60 degrees ahead and behind it, have their own large asteroid fields. These are reasonably stable places to put artificial constructs, especially if you're the option for some station keeping, but L1, L2, and L3 points are also options. L1 is always in between the two objects, and closer to the less massive of the pair, L2 is behind them and L3 is on the exact opposite side. How far the L1 and L2 are is dependent on the mass ratio of the two bodies in question, and in the Earth-Moon case it's around 5 6 of the way to the Moon from Earth to L1, about 200,000 miles or 330,000 kilometers from Earth, and about 7 6 that distance to out past the Moon from Earth to L2, about 240,000 miles or 385,000 kilometers from Earth, and that's basically where we put the James Webb Telescope. For lunar space elevators, the Earth, Moon, L1, and L2 are both attractive options. If you're curious, all five are potentially usable, but for L3, L4, and L5, we would be talking about making a big long ring along the Moon's orbital path around Earth. There are actual reasons why you might do that in a more distant future with a large buildup of orbital habitats and infrastructure in cislunar space, but we'll save that discussion for another time. L1 and L2 are, in the Moon's case, actually lunar synchronous, the equivalent of geosynchronous but for the Moon. They are for any tidally locked Moon around its planet, objects in a 1 to 1 orbital resonance, which is true of very nearly every Moon and would be for tidally locked planets too. There are none in our solar system, Mercury is in a 3 2 orbital resonance, rotating 3 times for every 2 orbits around the Sun, and probably isn't tidally locked simply because of how eccentric its orbit is and we tend to assume most cinder-like planets, or even habitable ones around the smaller red dwarf stars, are tidally locked. In all these cases their L1 and L2 points will be the places to put elevators, and also out from which you might be putting any arrays of solar shades to cool off the light side or give it a day-night cycle, and at L2 any mirrors for lighting the night side. Getting back to the Moon, the L1 and L2 are not stable for the Moon and only would be in the case of a perfectly circular orbit with few other bodies in play to perturb things. When the Earth and Moon are closest to each other, perigee, the distance to L1, or L2 for that matter, from the Moon's surface actually changes. Pluto and its moon, Charon, is about as stable as that arrangement gets of known bodies, and there, with both of them being tidally locked, you can actually forge a cable right between the two, surface to surface. We dubbed that construct the Acheron River in our episode Colonizing Pluto, but it should be noted that you could set up ring and tether systems between moving bodies like the Galilean moons of Jupiter. In our case, if we built an orbital ring around Earth at geostationary, or further out for that matter, we could run a tether from that to the Earth-Moon L1 point. It would need to move around that ring, and fairly fast, but at speeds where a direct transfer is feasible, allowing a rail car to leave any point on Earth and assuming it was airtight, able to deliver cargo or people directly to the Moon, non-stop if timed well. That's a little more far future than we're discussing today, though it requires no super advanced technology, and we'll discuss it more next month in our episode Interplanetary Infrastructure. It's mostly tricky because the Moon's distance to Earth is not constant. Our Moon is not particularly eccentric in its orbit but it still varies by about 10% in distance from when it's closest to Earth, perigee, and furthest from Earth, Apogee. The upside about unstable transport tethers though is that you can do a lot of station keeping just by being a bit smart and calculated about when and how you move and release mass from the tether. 
You can adjust tether length by having winches in excess length at either end or at midpoints even, and just spool or unspool it as needed. Also, tethers are not super big and massive, so on planets with decent magnetic fields you can use solar panels to run electromagnets to give them corrective shoves. Our moon can't really go that path but at the same time, an alternate use for a very thin solar mirror, besides shining light on a photovoltaic or thermal power generator, is to bounce off incoming photons in a chosen direction, and you can do station keeping with that too if you're using solar sail thin panels. That does allow some atypical scenarios for elevators on low gravity objects with low spin rates and no real stable spots. That generally means moons though, most asteroids spin faster than Earth does, often rotating a few hours. Objects tend to have their rotational rates slowed when they get snatched up as moons of other bodies, and it bleeds off until their rotational rate matches their orbital rate or they get tidally locked. In the Moon's case, a lot of correction can be made by using all the metal or fuel being moved off the surface, so the stability of that orbit isn't too big a concern. The question then is if you want the L1 or L2 for your elevator, and if you want to ship from the equator, as the poles are often of more interest to us on the Moon than the equator is. Though I was at a great talk recently by my friend Pascal Lee who made the case that the lunar polar regions are not necessarily such great places to do in situ extraction as we've been thinking they were. The main reasoning though was that we think we have a good chance of finding water ice there on those poles, particularly the South Pole, and this is handy because you can actually run a tether from the South Pole to the L1 as well. As we've noted in other discussion of space elevators, one option for avoiding using the equator for these is to have three or more tethers with non-equatorial anchor points on the planet or moon below, at least one in each hemisphere, rising to a shared geostationary terminus point and acting like guy wires on it. This requires a stronger tether, though not a lot stronger, and we have more than strong enough materials for a lunar elevator so options like this become possible. We also don't necessarily need to use more than two and one in both hemispheres for a lunar elevator. You need not have your tethers attached to the equator or poles for that matter, it lets you put them anywhere. Critically, it is not a bad idea to do a pair of polar tethers, one from each pole, and to equatorial tethers running out to the L1 and L2. They both serve different functions, indeed you might space four equatorial sites out at 90 degrees around the equator with each terminus station at L1 and L2 connected to two of those equatorial sites and each of those poles, and now you can correct a lot of perturbation simply by having big winches on those tethers that can lengthen or contract each tether, and you have four lines up to each station and down from there. More is better in my opinion, both multiple tethers running a few meters apart and parallel, and more sites, which helps a lot if one gets damaged and severed. The handy aspect here is there are plenty of mundane materials that can do the job, and for context, while these cables might be arbitrarily thick or thin, depending on anticipated throughput, a wrist-thick cable of most of the materials contemplated for this on the Moon would mass in the vicinity of 10 kilograms a meter or 10 tons a kilometer and be able to move cargo like a freight train would. But the basic design puts forth calls for a pencil thick cable coming in at something like 88,000 pounds or 40,000 kilograms for the whole lunar elevator and allowing a tether crawler of significant capacity. You start small and build up or just add more parallel tethers. You can have an internal power supply in such a crawler but we can also run a power cord along the tether or beam energy to it. So too, you can run fiber optics to it to allow very high bandwidth communications and the L1 point is always visible from Earth, something that is not true of the back side of the Moon, or even a lot of the crater locations we might be preferring for lunar installations, so you can have a continuous and dedicated communication portal from Earth to any point on the Moon. Incidentally, in practice, while you can build a non-tapering tether for the Moon, you probably still would taper the tether to be widest at the Lagrange point and skinnier at the connections to the Moon or to any extending whip-like segment going out even further. Also note that this need not be a single tether, you can multi-strand, have connection points, and have redundant cables running parallel that a crawler could connect to multiple love and to allow two-way traffic or passing slower crawlers. Alternatively, you can do a non-tapering tether, one whose thickness or cross-section remains the same and put it on a double pulley setup 
one at L1, one down on the ground, and this is considered easier to repair. It has the downside of requiring a wide strut to keep the cables from tangling, but you have similar concerns for cables running close together in parallel for redundancy. We do not necessarily need redundancy here either, the crawler is an airtight pod, and there's time to react to a severed cable or pods that skip the tether. Earthside you could build a parachute in for instance, and on the moon we might strap on an emergency fuel tank to allow options. It's even possible a liquid oxygen air reserve might do double duty as an emergency fuel supply, or rather oxidizer, since the majority of the weight of many rocket fuels is oxygen, and oxygen might also be a common byproduct of industries on the moon and regularly shipped out in this form for use on space stations and ships. So too, we often imagine shipping fuel from the moon to ships in cislunar space, and having a rig up there that allowed cargo pods to use that in an emergency is plausible enough as a safety feature. There are a lot of other options too, but critically, that lower gravity gives us way more reaction time to help or rescue a damaged or derailed pod or with a broken tether. Estimating the actual cost of a tether is a bit of a wild stab in the dark, you'll get figures of anywhere from $10,000 to a million dollars a pound to get something to the moon, but a price tag of several billion dollars seems plausible if we're shipping from home. That's viable of course, but the good news is that some of the material options for a lunar elevator would permit plausible manufacture on the moon from in situ resources, which is handy if you want to shift from pencil thick cables to several redundant, wrist thick megaton cables running to multiple sites. We mostly want such a tether for shipping things we're making on the moon up into orbit, not just for a handful of rovers or astronauts, so it would seem plausible that an effort to get in situ production of fuel or construction materials going on the moon could include the fabrication of thicker tethers for the elevator to ship stuff off with. The upside of the L1 tether of course is to ship stuff back home to Earth easier, but also to make landing easier. The moon has no atmosphere to air break in, and while its gravity is low, it isn't trivial either. You need fuel for that descent. The upside of something like a mass driver, a giant electromagnetic catapult tube to shoot spaceships or cargo pods out of, is that it can fire things out into space without fuel and is very easy to build in a low gravity and airless environment. The downside is you can't really land on that and bleed speed off. It is hypothetically possible to bleed speed off a ship by that same arrangement instead of adding it, but that is trying to thread the eye of a needle while moving over a thousand miles per hour, and if you mess up, you wreck that ship, that mass driver, and anything or anyone on that ship or nearby. Alternatively, you can make a rendezvous with a space station at L1 much easier, using fuel to slow your relative velocities to a crawl before docking and we do have some tricks we discussed in Colonizing series for bleeding speed off ships without using fuel for those seeking a rendezvous with larger airless moons and asteroids. Often this might be basically harpooning the ship with another tether. Incidentally, the L2 tether offers us the advantage of interplanetary launch. That L2 point behind the moon is of interest as a place constantly shielded from Earth's transmissions for doing good astronomy, as mentioned, that's where we put the James Webb Telescope and others, and for that reason. And it will only get more crowded in the next century or two, but the value of a tether extending to there and beyond is that it's a great slingshot for hurling ships out into the deeper solar system. Earth orbits the Sun quickly, and far more quickly than the Moon orbits us, but you can add the Moon's orbital velocity to ours for the purpose of launching something out to Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, and so on. You can add even more with that L2 tether, and you could let that tether extend as far as your materials could handle it, keeping in mind that you are increasingly far from both the Moon and Earth's gravity exerting force on the tether, though it should be noted that things accelerating down a tether are yanking on it at their own acceleration rate, so the faster you try to accelerate, the more stress you put on that tether. And for a fixed tether or track length, your final speed is very dependent on how fast you can accelerate. That is one advantage a mass driver has on an airless body like the moon over a tether. On the moon, it only needs to rise high enough to clear any large crater rim walls the track needs to pass through to stay fairly straight and avoid having the ship slam into them either. There's no air to climb above to escape drag forces like on Earth. That track can be arbitrarily massive and pinned deep to the ground, so your ship or launch platform can both be very massive and haul down that thing in a way a tether does not accommodate as easily. 
The existence of a lunar elevator and lunar mass driver do not conflict with each other, each has their values and pros and cons, and a lunar mass driver can contemplate blasting things into space at speeds high enough to reach other planets in weeks for instance, and we're not really contemplating that for tether-based launches. We also have the abridged version of space elevators, the Skyhook or Rotovator, which involves the same basic mechanics but, much like in our Venus case, is not attached to the ground or sea, but just dangles in the air. And we can put it on a drift rather than geostationary or lunar stationary orbit. You can also whirl them around like bolos, and all of this works way better without air and with lower gravity, they are a great option when a space elevator is not as practical. See the Skyhooks episode for more details on how those work, but for the Moon, I'd imagine the more likely deployment scenario would be a low orbit Skyhook that orbited every 2 or 3 hours and revolved rather than just dangled, to achieve a near stationary lowest dip point at the top of a crater wall or a tower near a mining site or fuel refinery to swing that cargo back up into orbit or fling it off to Earth. Speaking of towers, you might wonder if we might just build a space tower off the moon where no wind and low gravity make building enormously tall towers much easier, and this is definitely an option as an alternative to dangling a tether. Indeed you can even use them in conjunction to allow a space tower that rises out of the atmosphere and strongest gravity and has a space elevator connecting to its top or a skyhook that swings nearby periodically or your tower stretches above the atmosphere and that's where your mass driver connects to for the top of its track to allow an exit over the atmosphere. But I don't see the need on the Moon, with the exception of towers at the poles that would be out of the Moon's shadow and thus eternally sunlit and handy for solar power, and that requires no great structural strength. I can definitely envision shorter, wider conventional towers that have the space elevator tether connected to their tops. So, should we build a lunar elevator? For my part I'd say yes, I think it's definitely a phase 2 or 3 project for developing the moon, the sort of thing that waits until you have permanent installations already functioning. This is why the polar or non-equatorial option for the elevator is handy, you can potentially run your elevator to a pre-existing base or bases when that stage of development is reached. No special apparatus is needed at the connection site besides a winch to allow tightening or loosening of that tether and pre-existed landing facilities can still be converted if desired. In the end, it is a great place to test and practice with bigger scale tethers, close to home but not so close as to represent a hazard, so we can try them on the Moon, same for skyhooks or mass drivers too, and get that technology perfected before we try deploying them on more distant planets, moons, and asteroids, or even on Earth. In the end, we always talk about the Moon as a gateway to space, literally and metaphorically, and this is just one more example of how that's true, and who knows, one day you might be able to take an elevator or train ride straight from any city on Earth to the Moon. We'll get to the full upcoming schedule in a moment, but next week's episode, The Last Planet, is about life in the very distant future, at the end of time. And one of the more common solutions to surviving that end is to time travel back to an earlier universe, we do not look at that option in the episode but finishing production up on that made me want to discuss time travel again and I ended up writing the episode Retro Causality, which folks who voted in the episode image polls know has come up as our runner up a few times now. I decided to do it as a bonus episode over on Nebula and a chance to discuss what physics and quantum really tell us about time travel and cause and effect minus a lot of the techno-speak and hand waves that people often use for the topic. You can see Retro Causality now over on Nebula, our streaming service, and it's just the latest of dozens of bonus episodes and extended editions of our show, which you can see, along with every episode of the show, video and audio, without ads or sponsor reads, and days before they're out anywhere else. If you subscribe to Nebula, not only do you get to see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad-free, but we have lots of bonus content, including extended editions of mini episodes, as well as bonus and exclusive content like Retro Causality, Nomadic Minos on the Moon, Orc OR and Free Will, Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, Planets vs. Megastructures, Space Freighters, Colonizing Binary Stars, and many more. Nebula has tons of great content from an ever-growing community of creators, using my link and discount it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, 
less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during this episode, and it goes to supporting new content for myself and other creators. When you sign up my link, go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur, and use my code, Isaac Arthur, you not only get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, you will also be directly supporting this show. Again, to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive bonus content, go to go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur. So that will wrap us up for today, but we're just getting started for August and next week we'll head trillions of years into the future to the end of time and the final twilight on the last planet. Then it'll be time for our monthly Sci-Fi Sunday on Cyborg Armies, followed by exploring where we might get water and other volatiles in space with comet mining. After that, we'll look at the concept of devolution, and ask if fictional mutant degenerates like Morlocks and Chuds might be possible in our future. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, along with hours of bonus content, at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.